Welcome to the second lecture on Slaughterhouse Five. This second lecture is recorded live in class, but before we get to those sections, I want to set you up to take notes, or at least to take mental notes, on the key areas that will be covered here. In this lecture, we'll explore how Vonnegut's writing process changes from the mid-1940s to the late 1960s. He writes this book over nearly 25 years. Remember, Vonnegut begins working on this book as the organizing principles of modernism are fading from the American literary scene. Early drafts of this book are arranged as a straightforward chronological tale, with fully realized scenes moving toward the moment when Edgar Derby, among the rubble of Dresden, is ironically shot for the theft of a teapot, while around him most of the city has already been laid to waste. Over time, Vonnegut is deeply influenced by the new notes of postmodernism. He incorporates tropes of science fiction and fantasy. He includes humor. Perhaps most importantly, he fractures the novel in such a way that the presentation of its storyline no longer resembles the straightforward tales we've previously explored in this class. We'll also take a look at Vonnegut's large theme. As we've discussed in previous lectures, one organizing principle that separates literature from entertainment in the second half of the 20th century is the exploration of large, meaningful themes. Looking back, what large, culturally meaningful themes are there in The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe? I don't believe that most of Poe's tales offer space for substantial cultural exploration. Poe is interested in craft and emotional space. If Poe were writing today, his work would almost surely be seen as entertainment, not literature. Poe is important because he helps invent what fiction becomes. He is a genius in terms of craft, not so much intellectual message. The first cultural area that Vonnegut wants to explore in his novel is focused on the ways that mechanized warfare damages survivors. As discussed in the lecture you're about to hear, Vonnegut doesn't know the term PTSD because it hasn't been invented yet. World War II is the first time that hundreds of thousands of soldiers return to America unable to successfully reoccupy civilian life in the way they did before the war. In this novel, Vonnegut wants to explore this new unnamed condition so that people outside of the military better understand it and its ties to modern mechanized warfare. Billy Pilgrim here becomes the lead example of a survivor who has been deeply damaged in this way by warfare. But there are other examples in the book, Bernard O'Hare and even Vonnegut himself. Though most people now recognize the signs of PTSD, this is a new syndrome when Vonnegut is writing this book, and he believes he's examining an issue not previously explored at this depth in fiction. The second cultural issue has to do with human engagement of cultural wars. Vonnegut does not believe all wars can be avoided. Vonnegut, in fact, believes that sometimes armies must be engaged to protect human life or human freedoms. But Vonnegut is confused as to why nation states continually are drawn into cultural wars. The subject of this book is World War II, and overall Vonnegut thought that the prime mission of America was justified in World War II as it protected and freed European citizens. But this book is being written and published during the Vietnam era. Vonnegut believed that Vietnam wasn't about the protection of human life so much as it was a proxy war between two cultures, a democracy and the communists, focused on how a country in Asia would arrange its way of life moving forward. That for Vonnegut is a cultural war, not a war about real property or human life. Vonnegut in this is confused as to why countries repeatedly engage war to define the culture of other nations or to create buffers so that no outside influences change the culture of its homeland. Lastly, I should probably point out that this novel is also interested in the power of storytelling. 
One way of reading this novel is to consider that the time travel sections and the scenes played out in outer space may be powerful delusions, in other words, powerful stories that Billy Pilgrim is inventing so he can heal himself from the damages of war. In this, the novel wants to examine how the human mind is drawn in times of intimate crises toward narratives as humans seem uniquely designed to accept narratives in religion, myth, personal expression, and even fiction as an intuitive way to understand profound truths about oneself and the world around us. Now, let's move to the in-class lecture. Kurt Vonnegut has spent, let's see, years, um, over 25 years, trying to write a little itty-bitty book about World War II. My version of the book, I think, is 213 pages, 215 pages. But this book here has wide margins. Like, you could get in one of those little smart cars and drive around the margins and never bump into any text in this book. It has a, a significant letting between all the characters. So what's happened here in the layout of the book is that this is about 130 pages in terms of double-spaced uh, typed manuscript. And the good people at Dell Publishing have figured that all of you are in no way going to pay $10 for a book that's 130 pages long, but you could be tricked into paying $10 for a book that's 215 <coughs> pages long, or at least if you think it's really 215 pages long. And so this is what every freshman wants to do in freshman comp, wants to take their two-page essay and then with some magic of MS Word to somehow arrange that into a four-page essay, which is what they've done here. But this is a very, very short book. And Vonnegut tells us that he has written 5,000 pages in the attempt to somehow expunge the experience of being what he believes is the largest organized massacre in the history of humanity, so that he can externalize that experience, he can make something out, out of it, his own memories, he can push it out of himself, and hopefully he can mollify his conscience by at least believing that he's done something useful with all those terrible things that he has seen. For a long time, Vonnegut tries to write a book that's going to fit inside of this older box of literature. It's going to be a straightforward narrative that's going to end after the bombing of Dresden. He has two concerns inside the book that he wants to explore. The first thematic concern that he wants to explore is this. Vonnegut is aware that he is a witness to a unique transition in terms of how people react to warfare. We all know, and for all of our lives, except for mine, have had the term PTSD, right? Post-traumatic stress disorder, right? So you've had that your entire life. You know what that means. That means that if you have a traumatic experience, that that traumatic experience is going to damage you in terms of your ability to process thoughts or emotions or to experience the world in the same way you used to before the event as you move forward. They didn't have this term during Vonnegut's life. They don't have this term until um, after Vietnam. It comes as a technical diagnosis during Vietnam and then after Vietnam in the 1970s and early 1980s, it becomes a popular term that most everyone becomes familiar with as something new, a new category during the late 70s and early 80s. It's existed for your entire life. But when Vonnegut's writing about this, there is no term to describe what it is that he thinks that he's seen. In World War I, there was a joke term for people that came home from the war that had night terrors, that had difficulty sleeping, that had a reduced capacity to experience emotion. The joke term was shell-shocked. And there were, roughly, about 65,000 people that came home during World War II that experienced this condition. 
We move up to World War, World War I, there's 65,000. World War II, we move up to World War II. World War II, the United States estimates that 10% of the fighting force that goes over to Europe, 10% of the fighting force that goes over to Europe, comes back with something like the shell-shocked condition, with a lower ability of being able to engage in the world around them, with a diminished capacity for emotion, with some type of ongoing traumatic issue related to warfare. 10%, there were 16 million Americans that were engaged with World War II. So that means the number is right around 1.6 million people. So from World War I to World War II, we've gone from 65,000 to 1.6 million. The United States government at the time is also aware that if you participate in over 30 days of continuous combat, that you have exactly a 98% chance of returning with this condition Though, of course, they don't uh, release those numbers, and these elements are kept during the time of Vonnegut's writing and exploration, top secret. And so Vonnegut feels that by observing these things, talking with friends that he served with, that he's starting to see a new trend. And the equation might go like this, that mechanized warfare, the ability to continually heap large amounts of destruction on your enemy has a new result in terms of the survivors, the combatants that actually go home, and that these combatants that are repatriated to America, that they come back with a condition that most soldiers didn't have in World War I. And if you go back to the Civil War or the American Revolution, it seems to be almost (coughs) entirely absent there. And so the increase in military equipment also has a corresponding increase in a new type of internal damage. The first thing that Vonnegut wants to do with this book is to create a narrative so that he can explain in dramatic fashion how this new type of American warfare damages people in unique ways that the general American populace isn't yet familiar with. We're familiar with it, but we are also reading this book over 50 years after it was published. The second thing that Vonnegut wants to take a look at is the reasons that people go to war. Vonnegut, he passed away um, about 15 years ago, but before that, I I was able to, on two different occasions, go out to dinner with him and talk with him for a while. And Vonnegut was, I think, Um, He described himself as a realist. He did not think that all wars could be avoided. He thought that there was um, uh, some occasions that countries should go to war and their participation in in the war was justified. He thought in many instances that World War II was a justified war, even if he felt that America participated in things that might be described as war crimes. So, you know, the overall condition of World War II in terms of what was happening with the Holocaust in Germany, created a just cause to participate in that war, even if there are certain things that, during the war, that acted outside of just, just causes. So Vonnegut is not an idealist and thinks that, that people are, are capable of staying out of all wars. But there were different categories of war for Vonnegut. And so, Wars that were fought over real properties, such as an aggression uh, by one nation to take away property from another. Wars that were fought over the safety of a country's people. That these tended to be categorically uh, the types of wars that produced just participation from the groups that were being attacked. But there was another category of war that confused Vonnegut. And this other category of war might be described as an ideological war. And that's when one country goes to war with another country because it feels that its lifestyle is being threatened or because it feels that its lifestyle is so significant that it wants to, through the force of war, benefit another country by forcing them to live under that style. And so the subject of this book is World War II. But 
part of the materials in terms of its discussion elements are that this book is being published during uh, what war is America involved in in 1969 when this book is published? Vietnam. Vietnam. And Vonnegut would read Vietnam as one of these ideological wars. For Vonnegut, this is the type of war um, that's being waged in Asia where the communists and the capitalists are going to war to decide how a small nation is going to arrange its political and economic system. So this is a proxy war between ideology in terms of how Vonnegut reads the war. And Vonnegut is confused by this. He doesn't know why that when many people get together, not a hundred of us or a thousand of us or a hundred thousand of us, but like when 10 million people get together, when a nation state gets together, Vonnegut is under the impression that something unusual and sometimes damaging happens. That when you get a nation state together, 10 million people, let's say, that there becomes a type of group think that happens there, that that mass of people starts to believe that their way of life is the most significant and meaningful and best way of life of all those arranged anywhere around the globe. So if you go over to France and you ask the French people what the best way of life is, what are they most likely going to tell you? French way, right? You ask Americans what is the best way of life and they will tell you, right? And so there is this strong attachment Vonnegut is, is diagnosing that Americans feel to the culture that they have grown up in. And I don't think Vonnegut has any problems with people liking things that are familiar. For Vonnegut, the problems are when nation states become so defensive that they don't want any outside intrusion moving into their country that might change or alter their home culture so that they will become uh, pugilistic. They will become warlike against keeping those elements out. And also when nations so highly prize their way of life that they will go to war to enforce that way of life on other people because they believe it will be a benefit for them. And so Vonnegut has written 5,000 words, and a, a, a massive amount of words, 5,000 pages, a massive amount of words, major number of pages, as a way of trying to create the subject material into the traditional form of a novel. That is um, a novel that has external change, rising action, that means leads to some sort of um, internal change in the characters at the end of the story. And he hasn't been able to do it. In the mid-1960s, he goes to the University of Iowa's MFA workshop as a guest professor. He teaches there for two years. And while he's there, he talks with other writers and he starts to better understand some of the movements that are happening under the banner of postmodernism. He sees how some of the old style of novels are artificial, or at least he thinks they're artificial, so that maybe you could make something new out of your own novel. And he also starts to get the idea that you aren't limited to the materials that are presently in this box, that you can use humor, you can use science fiction, which he uses in his novel, as a way of creating a story that then is going to get at this subject content that he ultimately wants to explore through drama inside the book. And so after leaving the University of Iowa's writer's workshop, after his two-year stint, um, he comes away with strong ideas about how to reframe his Dresden experience into a novel. It's going to have Trophamadorians, which are science fiction creatures, it's going to have time travel and other science fiction elements. It's going to have fart jokes in it, so it's going to have very low humor in it at times. And it's also going to have its own form for what a novel can be. And once Vonnegut is able to free himself from the idea that a novel to be successful needs to fit inside the old style box for what literature is, once he's able to free himself from this constraint, he's able to go back to the material of Dresden and put together a very short but successful story about how a character who 
has some overlap with, with Vonnegut in terms of his uh, personal experience. How he's able to go back to that material to then create a narrative that has, in ways, a beginning, middle, and end, but how that beginning, middle, and end is going to talk about mechanized warfare and the damage that it produces in individuals, and then also how or why and what should we do about it. People continually go to ideological wars that are about arranging lifestyles in other parts of the world. So what's the type of book that Vonnegut produces? I'm here on the title pitch. Slaughterhouse-Five, or The Children's Crusade, A Duty Dance with Death by Kurt Vonnegut. A fourth-generation German-American now living in easy circumstances on Cape Cod and smoking too much. Who as an American infantry scout, or as the combat, as a prisoner of war, witnessed the firebombing of Dresden, Germany, the Florence of the Elbe, a long time ago and survived to tell the tale. This is a novel somewhat of the telegraphic, schizophrenic manner of tales of the planet Trelthamidor, where the flying saucers come from, peace. And so what does that mean in the manner of the tales of the planet of Trelthamidor? I'm going to jump up to page 87. On the night that Billy Pilgrim is kidnapped by the Trelthamidorians, he also explains to us what a Trelthamidorian novel is. He's already in the saucer at this point. Billy asked for something to read on the trip to Trough Amador. His captors had five million earthling books on microfilm, but no way to project them in Billy's cabin. They had only one actual book in English, which would be placed in a Trough Amadorian museum. It was Valley of the Dolls by Jacqueline Suzanne. There, there's a joke there that's now lost. Vonnegut didn't have a strong conception that this book was going to be read 50 years after he published it. And so there's some temporal jokes here. The, the joke is, is that the Trophamidorians have stolen the wrong book. This is a big soap opera of a book. This would be like if space aliens came to Earth now and decided to steal like the first Harry Potter book as a, an example of what Earth culture is really like. Billy read it, thought it was pretty good in spots. The people in it certainly had their ups and downs, ups and downs. But Billy didn't want to read about the same ups and downs over and over again. He asked if there was a please, some other reading matter around. Only trial Famidorian novels, which I'm afraid you couldn't begin to understand, said the speaker on the wall. Let me look at one anyway. So they sent him in several. They were little things. A dozen of them might have had the bulk of Valley of the Dolls with all its ups and downs, ups and downs. Billy couldn't read trial Famidorium, of course but he could at least see how the books were laid out in brief clumps of symbols separated by stars. Billy commented that the clumps might be telegrams. Exactly, said the voice. They are telegrams? There are no telegrams on Trothamador, but you're right. Each clump of symbols is a brief, urgent message describing a situation, a scene. We Trothamadorians read them all at once, not one after the other. There isn't any particular relationship between the messages except that the author has chosen them carefully, so that when seen all at once, they produce an image of life that is beautiful and surprising and deep. There's no beginning, no middle, no end, no suspense, no morals, no causes, no effects. What we love in our books are the depths of many marvelous moments seen all at one time. And that's what Vonnegut has tried to produce here. This is a Trothamidorian novel. It has many brief scenes like postcards or vignettes or telegrams. The point of the shortness, the brevity, and the reduced scenes are so that you can disagree with me if you want to. You can read the book all in one sitting. You can hold all of Billy Pilgrim's experiences in your head, and you can make meaningful connections with them, specifically how the war material connects with the damage, the psychological damage that Billy has after the war. Those are some of the meaningful connections that you're supposed to make by holding all of the pieces of the book in your mind. Vonnegut tells us that there's no middle, no beginning, no end to his book. There's no climaxes, no thrills, and no conclusions. That is, he tells us that he dispenses with chronology, which is only partially true. 
And so in this book, if you were to dispense entirely with chronology, that is, if you were to take all of his scenes and just kind of throw them up in the air and then put them into the book in whatever fashion they came down in, I think that we would probably want to go outside and slam our head against the tree. Maybe you want to do so already. That's okay. Um, But that's not exactly what he's done. He's telling us that's what he's doing, but I think he has the good sense to realize that that type of reading experience would be utterly unmanageable for any of us. But instead, what he's done in creating his own novel is there are essentially two elements of framework here. There is a chronological story that occupies most of the book. And that chronological story is the story of Billy Pilgrim in World War II. And that, those are the longest sections, and those move forward in a straightforward chronological manner. Billy is with the Three Musketeers in 1944. Billy is captured by the Germans. Billy is on a train going to the uh, prisoner of war camp. Billy is being taken into the prisoner of war camp. Billy meets the British soldiers. Billy is working at a factory that produces an enriched, uh, vitamin-enriched, malt syrup for pregnant women. Billy is in the uh, meat locker when Dresden is destroyed um, by the bombing of of, um, British and uh, American planes. And so almost all of that is in straightforward chronological fashion. But around that, Vonnegut is laying in the rest of Billy's life. Billy gets married. Billy's with his father in the pool when he's young. Billy is in the hospital one time and then another time. Billy is looking for the books of Kilgore Trout. All of that other material outside of the war is arranged around the 1944-1945 experiences, I think, with some degree of randomness. So with this, with this structure of a novel that's designed so that you can hold all of Billy's life in your head at one time, We have the moment of Billy's conception on one hand in this book, along with his childhood experiences. And then on the other hand, what's the last thing that we know about Billy? How he's killed, right? With that laser rifle after giving a speech about the religious or philosophical ideas that he has absorbed from the Trout Amadorians. So we get his whole life from birth until death A good chunk of the novel is told in a straightforward fashion around the war, but those other scenes fill everything out so we can understand who Billy was before the war, what the war did to him, and what's the condition of his life after the war, which many years after the book is published will be called PTSD. And so if this book wants to take a look at um, the type of psychological trauma that happens to soldiers during mechanized warfare, it's going to give us kind of a framework in a number of places to think about this condition, which during Vonnegut's life was something that he believes he's observing en masse for the first time in human culture. And so um, in that first section in which Billy is with Roland Weary, He's going to start, Vonnegut is going to start to talk about different types of trauma. And so he's going to give us an example of trauma that we know. And then he's going to start to build on that to the type of trauma that um, we uh, don't know. So with Roland Weary's knife, Roland Weary has this triangular blade. And Roland Weary has this kind of unusual speech about the triangular blade. And he says that there are regular knives, that if you have a puncture wound from a regular knife, what happens then is that the um, wound will scab over and will eventually heal. And though you might have a scar, you'll be able to go about your life as you had before. But Roland Weary, the sadist in our book, is enamored with this triangular knife with a a pyramid-shaped point that's not going to make a slit wound, it's going to make a puncture wound. And what he says about that wound is that this is the type of wound that's going to fester and ooze over and it's never going to heal. 
And Vonnegut's making a thematic point there. And he's saying that the types of injuries that these men are going to come home with on the inside, though you might not be able to see them, are these types of psychological injuries. The types that are never going to scab over, never going to heal, that these men are never going to be free of ever again. He has another way of thinking about this at the end of the first chapter. And that's the chapter that's all about Kurt Vonnegut and the experience of writing this book, kind of like a, a preface or a foreword. And at the end of that, when he's about to fly over to Germany, he spends a night in New York near the airport before he goes over to catch his flight. And in the nightstand drawer, he finds one of the Bibles, um, one of the Gideon's Bibles that have been left there for people to read. And he just happens to open it up to um, uh, Genesis, where he reads the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the book's going to make a point about Vonnegut's experience, Billy Pilgrim's experience, about what it's like to have this new yet unnamed type of psychological damage that Vonnegut feels that he has, that he thinks that his friend Bernard O'Hare has. He goes over to Bernard O'Hare's house. Bernard O'Hare spent years overseas. How many stories is Bernard O'Hare able to remember about being overseas? Yeah, like a couple, like hardly anything. And so either Bernard O'Hare is unwilling to rummage around in his soul and his memory and bring forth these experiences because he knows they're painful, or he's repressed them in such a way that he's unable to get to them anymore. He has this type of damage. Billy Pilgrim has this type of damage. Billy Pilgrim is hospitalized twice because he's not able to engage successfully in his job with others. Kurt Vonnegut has the same type of damage. For 25 years, almost 24 years, he's trying to write a very short book to externalize the damage that he picked up in Dresden to make something useful or artistic out of it. It tells us early on in the book that at night what he does is he tries to go into this type of talking therapy a long time ago, before cell phones and before you could direct dial long distance numbers, you had to use the operator to connect you with um, uh, people outside of your immediate area code. And so he tells us that after smoking and after drinking too much, he tells us that with a breath like mustard, gas, and roses, he would get on the phone and with the help of the operator, get himself connected with this friend or that from the military so that he could talk through the experiences that he had had overseas. That language, I think, is designed to bring him back to the point where this damage first entered him so that maybe he might be able to figure out a way out of it. There is someone like this in every dorm, I think. In my experience, you can think about your own dorm experience. There is someone like this in every dorm that is going to continually talk about um, the issues that they had in high school. You've already thought of that person in your dorm right now. And that continually talking about things that happened in the past is often arranged as a type of talk therapy to bring them back to those moments, to figure out a way to move them beyond the trouble that they experienced during those years. That seems to be what Vonnegut's doing here. That Vonnegut is saying that, look, my novel is filled with all these characters, including me. On the night before he flies out of New York to go to Germany, he takes the Bible out of the nightstand and he opens it up to the book of Genesis, the very beginning of the Bible, and he reads the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah goes like this. Messengers of the Lord come down to Lot and say, essentially, Lot, you're a good and moral person. You live around cities that aren't very ethical. But God has looked down on you and your family and your servants and has decided to give you some information so that you can save yourself and the people that you live with. You should leave your house and go up off over those foothills because soon these cities are going to be destroyed. Anyone know how the cities are destroyed in, in uh, Sodom and Gomorrah? Fire and brimstone comes from where? 
comes down from the heavens, comes down in the sky, and wipes out the city. Where in our book does fire come down from the sky to wipe out the city? Dresden. Okay, it's already starting to make parallels for us. And so um, these messengers tell Lot that he and his family and the servants should all leave. And that the only thing that they should not do is what? Look back. And so as they're making their way up the foothills, who is the one person that doesn't follow the directions? His wife. And so she turns and looks back at the destruction behind her. And because of that, as a consequence, what happens to her is that she's calcified into a pillar of salt so that her physical form is forever looking back towards the cities that were destroyed. Vonnegut says to us that he finds her reaction the most human. He tells us that he finds her reaction the most understandable, the most relatable. Well, why does he think that it's the most relatable? Well, it's exactly what he's done. He says this is part of the terms of the condition that he thinks that he has. Vonnegut hasn't been calcified, so he no longer has mobility. He has full mobility of his limbs. He can walk around. He can move things if he wants to. He doesn't have that. But inside, The eyes of his soul for the last 24 years have been turned back and have been calcified to look at the city that he saw destroyed by fire that rained down from the sky. He has been focused on that over and over and over in a way that he's not able to move beyond. Billy Pilgrim has the same condition. Bernard O'Hare has the same condition. And this book then wants to take a look at who these people are. Billy Pilgrim's not able to work. Other people don't understand the concerns that Billy Pilgrim has. Other people don't understand that the war has produced this damage inside of Billy Pilgrim. And then at a certain point, Billy Pilgrim starts to get better. When he meets the trial Fabadorians, he gets this new philosophy somewhat like a religion, a way of thinking about the meaning of life. And with that, he becomes evangelical about it. That is, he wants other people to share this worldview that he has. And so what are some of the things that Billy Pilgrim has learned from the Trial Famidorians that make his life more manageable? So here's one of the things that the Trial Famidorians tell Billy. They say to Billy, Billy, you earthlings, with your really small brains and your reduced way of understanding the external world, live under the delusion that people have control of their actions, that they have agency. But really, Billy, the world is a system of determinism. The problem is you just can't see it that way. The world is arranged the trial amateurians tell Billy, like the Rocky Mountains. Time is like an image of the Rocky Mountains. Trial amateurians with their large brains and their more accurate way of seeing the external world are able to see all moments of time. And all moments of time have always exist, always will exist, and always are existing in the present moment. The problem with you, Billy, is it's though you have been strapped to a a rail car with a pole, and you've been tied to that pole, and in front of you, there's a telescope. And one eye is covered, but you can look through the telescope to see that stretch of mountains. And, well, at this particular moment, you can see a cliff. And then the train lurches forward a little bit. And then you can see a peak. And then you can see a saddleback formation between the peak and whatever comes next. And the car keeps moving forward. And Billy, this has given you the illusion that only one moment of time exists at one moment. But if you had a larger brain and you weren't tied to that rail car and you weren't looking through this ridiculous telescope, Billy, you would understand that all moments of time exist always have exist and will 
exist into the future. And what this means, Billy, is, is that some force a long time ago scripted everything out. It's not a system of free will. You have the illusion that you have agency, but really, Billy, what you are is that you are a sentient consciousness inside of this fleshy costume. And you go around saying things, but those things you say were all written a long time ago, and you go around doing things. But that's just stage drama that was in that same script as well. Billy, you suffer from a type of survivor's guilt because you went through Dresden but survived on the other side. You saw terrible things, and the people in your home country participated in that. The first night, it was primarily British Air Force that came in and bombed Dresden, but then the American planes arrived as well. But Billy, you couldn't change the outcome. Even if you were one of the bomber planes, you would still have to follow the script. Even if you were the commander-in-chief, president of the United States, you would not be able to change the outcome because everyone has to follow the script. Billy, you have a great deal of guilt, but once you embrace the reality of the, ter- the deterministic world that we really live in, you can rise above that guilt and find a sense of peace and freedom. Give me something else that Billy Pilgrim learns from the trial of Didn't he learn that he can kind of focus on the good memories of good times? Yeah, he learns that he can learn. Let me see if I can find that section. He learns a couple things in that passage. He's at the zoo in Trothamador. He's in his cell that has, uh, you know, oxygen and stuff like that in there, not the cyanide that's outside the cell. And he's having a conversation with one of the zoo, I don't know, docents, guys, whatever you want to call them. And he wants to know about the end of the universe. If the Trothamadorians can see everything, he wants to know how it all ends. We blow it up. Experimenting with new fuels for our flying saucer. A trial famine orient test pilot presses the starter button and then the whole universe disappears. So it goes. Okay. Well, first, I think, message here is what is the mechanism that brings about the end of everything? I think Vonnegut's suggesting that if there was experimental jet fuel that made things go very fast, What entity in the United States would have that experimental, very fast jet fuel? Military. Military, right. So the suggestion there is that military escalation brings about the fiery end of the universe. So it goes. Well, if you know this, said Billy, isn't there some way you can prevent it? Can't you keep the pilot from pressing the button? He has always pressed it, and he always will. We always let him, and we always will let him. The moment's structured that way. So, Billy said groping, I suppose the idea of preventing war on Earth is stupid too. Of course! But you do have a peaceful planet here. Today we do. On other days, we have wars as horrible as any you've ever seen or read about. There isn't anything we can do about them. So we simply don't look at them. We ignore them. We spend eternity looking at pleasant moments. Like the day at the zoo. Isn't this a pleasant moment? So what the Troth Amadorian says is that Billy... How you get over these things is that you train your mind. If you have seen terrible things, you teach yourself not to look at them. You look at other things to say, like today at the zoo, isn't this a nice moment? Focus your mind to look at things that don't trouble you. What's the most important thing that Billy says that he learns on 12th Avenue? Billy, though I don't think he understands this, is haunted by death. He's seen thousands and thousands of dead bodies over in Dresden. And these are the memories that he takes with him. The trial Thamidorians teach him that Billy, along with all these other things, you also have a ridiculous understanding of what death is. Death is a particularly bad moment for the individual that's experiencing it, but they are equally alive in all of these other moments. Those people that you saw whose bodies were liquefying like melting candles after Dresden. The people who died because they were asphyxiated and incinerated. They either couldn't breathe or they were burned to death in Dresden. Billy, you can feel bad for them in that moment, 
but death is not the finality to their existence. There are all types of other moments that concurrently exist with that, that still exist in the present. They are off at a ball game. They are out to dinner one night. They are having a lovely time on that boat over there. Billy is able to take all of these things together and assemble them in such a way so that he is able to rise above the um, trauma that he's experienced in Dresden and become a more functioning member of um, society. The Trout Thabadorians are described as plumbers' helpers in the book, which is just an old-fashioned way of talking about a plunger. And so my question for you then is, how are we supposed to read the Trout Thabadorians and the Trout Thabadorians section of this novel? That is, do we have traditional science fiction here? So in those Star, uh, Star Wars movies, the Star Wars movies have human characters like Luke Skywalker, and then they have uh, alien characters like Chewbacca, and we're supposed to think that these characters exist in the same space as co-equal figures inside the book. Is that what we have here, or are we supposed to think that the Trial characters exist in a different way in the book than the other human characters that are around Billy. Billy is away for months and months on Trail Famidor, but no one seems to miss him. So Billy tells us that time, time works differently on Trail Famidor. I guess the question that I'm kind of like trying to lean towards is, are, are we supposed to see these characters as real in the same way that Bernardo Hare and Billy Pilgrim and Valencia are real? Or is Billy manufacturing this experience because he needs it so desperately? Or to put it this way here, what is our narrative lens for this novel? Do we have a narrative lens that over here at a distance works like um, a video camera? Do we have a narrative lens that's capturing the experience of what Billy and the characters around him are doing, or do we have a narrative lens that's situated inside of Billy's consciousness that is merely formalizing the thoughts and perceptions of Billy as he thinks he is encountering the world around him? That is, do we have um, a narrative experience that is telling us what's happening out in the world, or do we have a narrative presence that's telling us about Billy's thought life and what he believes he's experiencing, even if it's not true? What do we have in this book? Yeah. Uh, I think it's in his head. I think, I think the part that was really telling me, it's either like chapter seven or eight, when he sees all the sci-fi books in the window of that store, and then he goes in uh, to the store and sees that, um, one of the books is about uh, aliens capturing people and putting them in a zoo. And then there's like a magazine with, with the lady that he's in the zoo with, and there's even a movie with her in it. Okay. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of things that could kind of work its way into his head, and then he could kind of bring them together to build a story. Okay, so let's take a look at that. Let's break that down a little bit. Maybe Billy's mind is so damaged that he needs to manufacture a new belief system for himself that will bring him a type of wholeness and maybe he's using the materials around him. So you're talking about that bookstore. The examples you brought up, I think, all come from that bookstore. And so there's a novelist that Billy and his friend Elliot Rosewater are enamored with named Kilgore Trout, the least popular author ever. Nobody wants his books. Billy loves them. At a certain point while they're um, in the hospital, the novel tells us this. Another time, Billy heard Rosewater say to his psychiatrist, I think you guys are going to have to come up with a lot of wonderful new lies, or people just aren't going to want to go on living. And then a little bit later, it says, so they were trying to reinvent themselves. In their universe, science fiction was a big help. After that, Billy 
becomes enamored with Kilgore Trout and he starts to wander into a bookstore. It's a particular type of bookstore in Times Square. Times Square now is where um, all the Disney musicals play. Lion King, Frozen, Aladdin, that's where they play. Times Square in the 1950s was more like Amsterdam. The bookstore that he's wandered into is an, an adult bookstore that's going to sell uh, pornographic literature and maybe certain types of toys and things like that. And I know that now, I live an hour south of campus, that you can advertise your adult bookstore any way you want to. Um, as I used to drive to campus a couple years ago, there on the hill by Avila was a billboard that was for the San Luis Obispo, I forget what it was, San Luis Obispo Porn Palace. And then it had like a picture of a lacy bra and handcuffs. So you can advertise your adult bookstore any, time, any way you want to now. But back in the 1950s, you weren't able to do that. And so adult bookstores had to put up a, a retail front that disguised them as some other type of more respectable business. And so the brothers that run this adult bookstore have looked around for material they could put in the windows that would attract absolutely nobody to come inside. And they've landed on Kilgore Trout put a number of books in the window that nobody wants to read by Kilgore Trout, except Billy. And so Billy sees these books and he goes inside. And among the Kilgore Trout novels, like you were pointing out, there's one that's called Maniacs in the Fourth Dimension that are about creatures that are able to move through <clears throat> and see through time. There's a book called The Big Board about humans that are kidnapped and placed into zoos and outer space, like what Billy thinks has happened to him. There's another book called Gospel from Outer Space. Gospel from Outer Space is about a new type of good news that's going to come down to help humans. And maybe that's the biggest stretch thematically in terms of Billy's experience. But I think there's a, a note there that, that strikes with what Billy's doing as well. And while, while he's Inside the bookstore, what does he see? He sees um, this magazine up front. Um, and the magazine features uh, a picture of an actress from a specific subgenre of film that uh, explains that Montana Wild Hack has gone missing and is presumed dead, probably at the bottom of the river with um, cement wrapped around her feet. And maybe what is starting to happen here, that later in life, when Billy becomes more desperate for a type of um, message that can bring him up out of his despondency, that he starts to manufacture a potent fantasy that's populated with many ideas, experiences that he's collected over the years and is projected inside of his head as a fantasy that he believes, but if our narrative lens was over here, inside the camera, no one else would be seen because it's all happening inside his head. There are also long stretches that take place in Germany that start to suggest that what Billy is doing is that he is uh, cannibalizing his own experiences as a way of making this trial Famidorian fantasy. When Billy is kidnapped by the trial Famidorians, he's put in the hold of a saucer. And in that saucer with him is a bunch of furniture that was stolen from the Sears and Roebuck warehouse that the Trial Thamidorians are going to take with him to Trial Thamidor to populate a zoo cell. When Billy is taken by the Germans and put on another conveyance against his will and taken off to the prisoner of war camp, on that train, aside from the other prisoners, what is, the one, what is the one car contain that doesn't contain any prisoners? Does anyone remember? The yeah, and what's in the, what's in the car, the guard's car, other than the guards? The furniture. The furniture. Where did they get the furniture? Yeah. From where they've uh, been stationed and invaded? Probably. Yes, so it's, it's stolen furniture that they've taken from one of their missions. Okay, so the novel is going to start to set up a series of parallels with us that work like this. Billy Pilgrim might also be 
cannibalizing experience in Germany as part of the basis for Trothamidor. And it's going to put us, they're going to put these sections side by side so that we can see that there's some constructiveness that is tying these elements together for us. I'm on page 77. Here's where this daisy chaining begins. The hold of the saucer was crammed with other stolen merchandise, which would be used to furnish Billy's artificial habitat in a zoo in Trothamidor. The terrific acceleration of the saucers that left Earth twisted Billy's slumbering body, distorted his face, dislodged him in time, sent him back to the war. When he regained consciousness, he wasn't on the flying saucer. Where was he? Well, he was on the anagram that maybe, and only maybe, gave rise to the flying saucer experience. He was in a boxcar crossing Germany again. So the novel here, as it starts out, is asking us to take a look at the trout Amadorian saucer filled with stolen furniture, and then sending us back to the train car. <laughs> Billy's put in the saucer against his will. Billy's put in the train car against his will. The saucer has people that speak with a German accent. The um, train has people that speak with a German accent. The saucer is filled with stolen furniture, and so is the train. A few pages later, when they get to the prisoner of war camp, here's where we get to a place that maybe is the inspiration for a trough amateur. Billy blacked out as he walked through gate after gate. He came to what he thought might be a building on Trail Famidor. It was surely lit and lined with white tiles. It was on Earth, though. It was a delousing station through which all new prisoners had to pass. Billy did, as he was told, took off its clothes. That was the first thing they told him to do on Trail Famidor, too. So it's giving us a look at those two situations together. The Trail Famidorians and the Germans speak alike, similar speech patterns, even almost identical sentences in, one, in, in various places. At one point when a German pushes down an American, the American shoots back, why me? The German says, why you? Why anybody? This is almost exactly the exchange that Billy has with the Trout Amadorians as he's being taken to Trout Amador. Billy licked his lips, thought a while, inquired at last, why me? That is a very earthling question to ask, Mr. Pilgrim. Why you? Why us for that matter? Why anything? Okay. The Trout Amadorians are the joke anthropologists. That is, they take a look at large movements in human civilization, and they come up with ridiculous conclusions. Wars are not uh, aggressions between two groups of people, wars are, according to the Trout Amadorians, attempts to change the environment so that the area is uninhabitable for people for a period of years. The other joke anthropologist is Howard Campbell, who explains who the Americans are to the Germans in that similar jokey style. Billy Pilgrim the book tells us only later in life, after a celebration, goes outside and is kidnapped by the Trout Famidorians. But he doesn't talk about it for years. What is the accident that Billy has before he starts writing letters to the Ilium newspaper about his experience on Trout Famidor? The plane crash. How many people survived the plane crash? Two. Two. Him and the co pilot. Where are Billy's most serious injuries? He's had some type of head trauma. And after that, he starts talking about the Trout Amadorians. And so the book is at least encouraging us to say that this experience over here might not be a realistic presentation of the Trout Amadorians in the same way that Chewbacca is supposed to be a realistic alien that coexists with Han Solo and the rest in the Star Wars movie. But maybe what we are doing inside this book is we are following the thought processes of an individual who has been deeply damaged by the war and now after years of being unable to move beyond that damage is starting to create his own fantasies. He's creating uh, powerful beings, godlike beings, um, not God as in the creator of the universe God, but God like in the Roman gods. Uh, creatures that have 
abilities, rational uh, physical abilities beyond those of mere mortals. He's maybe created out of the Kilgore Trout novels, out of the things that have happened to him in Germany, this fantasy where the Trout Amadorians live. And the Trout Amadorians are going to be smarter, more technologically advanced, and more powerful than human beings. And therefore, Billy's creating a fantasy that he thinks is real. And in that fantasy are creatures that have a deeper understanding of human culture that then relay back to him, coincidentally, the exact right philosophy that Billy needs to rise up out of his despondency and to be able to engage life again. Billy, it's not your fault that people were killed. Billy, death isn't that um, what you think it means. Billy, you don't have control of your own actions. Those are scripted by other people. Billy, the path forward is to ignore all of the trouble out there. Now comes the confusing part. Vonnegut has a love-hate relationship with the academy, with the universities. He thinks that universities, he thought universities were a terrific institution in America that promoted the arts, promoted sciences, but he also thought universities were elite institutions. And he wanted in ways to have his cake and eat it too. He is clearly, by putting the trial fight in the Midorian sections right next to the um, German sections that maybe inspired the trial Amadorian sections have encouraged us to think that perhaps this is a manufactured fantasy based in part on things that Billy's read and experienced in his own life. But Vonnegut also thinks that American universities are elitist institutions and he doesn't want people like you, smart individuals, to say that they know that there is only one way to read this book and that is that this is the story of someone who has a PTSD and we are following his thoughts as though his reality inside of this novel becomes through language our reality as well. And so Vonnegut has done something that complicates all of this a great deal. The trial Thamidorian sections maybe are imagined by Billy. Vonnegut goes out of his way and the beginning of the book in chapter one to say that the war part, anyway, should be considered as a type of personal truth. The war parts, anyways, are real, is what he says. The things on Earth seem to exist within this type of reality. While on Earth, Billy Pilgrim says that he knows how he's going to die. And then what he does is he takes that knowledge and he speaks it into a Recorder, and this would be a reel-to-reel -reel recorder with a large condenser microphone. And he explains that he's going to be killed in the future after giving a speech by a laser rifle, and that will be the end of him. And he takes that tape down to the Ilium Bank and Trust and puts it into a safe deposit box. And Vonnegut seems to be putting a fence up around here because a damaged mind in a novel in which the narrative presence is placed deeply inside of Billy's consciousness can produce language that creates a world that Billy experiences that other people around him do not. That's a possibility. But by putting the tape in here, it creates the possibility of reading the book in another way. The damaged mind can produce the Trothamidorians, but a damaged mind does not produce sure knowledge of the future. Vonnegut seems to be saying, okay, you and the university or elsewhere, if you want to read this as though we are following the thought processes of Billy Pilgrim, go ahead. Billy Pilgrim walks out this door and on the other side of it, he finds himself in 1944 in a boxcar crossing Germany again. You don't have time travel in this version of the book. What you have is a powerful memory that Billy can't get away from. So he walks out that door there, and he feels as though he is re-experiencing it. He is trapped inside the memory again that he's crossing Germany in a boxcar in 1944. You can read it that way. Billy thinks that he's talking to aliens that give him this new religious outlook on life that saves him from the troubles he's experienced in, in the past, you can read this as a fantasy projection that Billy 
creates for himself as a way of saving himself. You can read it that way. But if you want to take the other path and say this is all science fiction, go ahead and do that because that type of reading of the book is not going to account for the tape that Billy leaves behind in the safe deposit box that has sure knowledge of the future that he hasn't experienced yet. It causes all kinds of problems because in this reading of the book where it's situated inside of Billy's Pilgrim's head as a type of a stream of thought novel, the trial Damadorians and their message can be easily dismissed. This is the projection of a damaged mind. But if we're over here and it's a type of science fiction in which all the creatures have an equal reality, then maybe the book is telling us that there is value in considering what the trial Thamidorians say, because if they are real in the same way Billy Pilgrim is real, their message then does save him. And so it complicates things quite a bit. And with this, we come to the end of this second lecture on Slaughterhouse-Five. Kurt Vonnegut has created an inventive book, which on the surface appears to be science fiction with time travel and space aliens. But beneath that, the novel may, and this is only may, instead present Billy Pilgrim's thoughts moment by moment. It's possible that there's no time travel, just powerful memories experienced by Billy. Because the novel, in this way of reading it, is presenting to us as readers Billy's thoughts, when Billy believes that he is experiencing something real, it's presented to us as real. Likewise, the Trial Thamidorian sections may be a type of personal mythology constructed by Billy's subconscious that takes materials from his own life and the Kilgore Trout novels and arranges them as a story in which space aliens give Billy pop psychology directions on how to be whole again. But as with the time travel, it's possible that in the world of this novel, these stories, too, only exist in Billy's mind. Because these stories seem true to Billy, they are presented to us as readers as truth as well. In this reading of the book, the novel becomes a way for readers to understand moment by moment the thought processes of a person with PTSD, how perception veers away from the real, and how desperate the mind is to fabricate ideas that will facilitate a return to normalcy, even if those ideas are based in a self-constructed fantasy. <laughs>